Looks like we've just reached the top of the hour, so it's time to get started. Welcome to the 2021 Groundfish Seminar Series. This is the ninth and final talk of the season. We are recording this presentation uh, for people who can't make it or people want to review this. It will be available on our webpage later. Since we are all doing the seminar remotely, the speaker will use a pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific items on the slides. And to help with this format, we ask that you mute your audio and turn off your video feed to reduce distractions for all the other participants. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar, at which point you can unmute yourself and ask questions directly to our speaker, Rebecca, or if you think you might forget your questions, you can type the questions into the chat box at any time during the seminar, and we will compile them to ask following Rebecca's presentation. So here's some background about our speaker today. Rebecca Peters is a marine resource scientist at the Maine Department of Marine Resources, where she leads the Maine New Hampshire Inshore Trawl Survey, and that will be the focus of her talk today. Rebecca earned her bachelor's from Old Dominion University and her master's from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in 2016. Upon graduating, Rebecca was awarded the C. Grant Canals Marine Policy Fellowship in 2017, where she worked in the NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology to support the Habitat Science Program and NOAA's Ecosystem Science and Management Working Group. So with that, I'll pass the floor to you, Rebecca, and turn off my microphone. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so like you said, I'm Rebecca. Um, I work for the state of Maine, of the state agency of the Maine Department of Marine Resources. And I'll just be giving an overview of the Maine, New Hampshire and Sword Trawl Survey today. Um, so before I get into um, before I get into anything, I want to introduce um, who the Maine Inshore Trawl Survey team uh, is at Maine DMR. Um, so me, Rebecca Peters, I'm going to be presenting today, and then I also work with Brian Donahue. She's the lead for our aging lab here at DMR, also works on the survey, um, and Lulu Bates, who She'll be taking on the lead of a project I'll be talking about later, um, looking at some of the contents that we collect on the survey. And I should also mention, since we are the main New Hampshire in Sword Trial Survey, we do also also cover New Hampshire waters, and we do work with the state agency there, New Hampshire Fish and Game, um, to help complete that part of the survey. So their staff comes and rotates on the survey for that week um, to help with their portion of the survey too. So it is a collaborative survey between states. So just a brief introduction to what this is. Um, the Maine New Hampshire Inshore Trawl Survey is a fishery independent survey for all marine resources in the inshore Gulf of Maine. Um, since we do have one of the largest, or we have the largest lobster fishery here um, in the country, a lot of people assume that we are a lobster survey, but we are an ecosystem survey. We cover all marine resources um, within the inshore Gulf of Maine that we catch. Um, so this survey started in the fall of 2000. It's a biannual survey, so it's conducted in the spring and fall every single year. We try to, in the spring and fall, we try to overlap with when the NOAA bottom trough survey is in the same region, so it's comparative between surveys. Um, and so our survey will, in the spring, it happens in May and until the first week of June, and then in the fall, we're out in the last week of September until the, um, to the end of October. And our survey lasts five weeks every um, in each spring and fall. So when our survey was getting up and running, uh, there was an external technical review of the survey, and that concluded in 2005, and concluded with the results that we have a strong scientific survey program. So our data is very useful and can be very useful for the stock assessments and management of all the species that we um, see in the Gulf of Maine. So one important um, aspect of our survey and why our survey is so successful and able to be conducted in the inshore Gulf of Maine is because we're a collaborative survey. When this survey was getting up and running, the, um, the original survey crew um, that was designing the survey, they worked really closely with the commercial fishing industry to design the survey. And they had, and the commercial industry had direct input in um, our survey area where, um, and what our gear type was that we were using. Um, also, our survey is conducted on a commercial 
commercial fishing vessel. Um, every year we use this as our survey platform and we work actively with the captain and crew of this survey uh, when we're just picking toes for uh, each survey to make sure that we can get them all done. And then the crew that works with us on the survey, they actively help us in catch processing and data collection too. Um, and one, the only way that our survey can be successful in these waters, because like I said, we have um, the largest lobster fishery in the nation. Um, it's a fixed gear fishery. Uh, we work closely with them to send out postcard mailings to alert them that our survey started. And on that postcard, we have a link to our website and also just upgraded that to have a QR code so they can easily access our website from that mailing to then get access to static images of where our tow locations are and all of the Latin longs for that information. But then we also improved that by creating an online um, RTIS interactive map where now they can access this via their smartphone, seeing that they're out there fishing, uh, setting their gear. They can look at their uh, the map on their smartphone and on there's a location button they can then click and see where our tow locations are in relation to where they're fishing. So we're made all these improvements to help communicate where our locations, our tow locations are um, so they can help move their gear so we can complete our locations. So some background on our survey. Um, the goal of our survey is to provide data to fishery managers on all of the commercially and recreationally important species that we find in the inshore Gulf of Maine. So prior to the start of our survey, these uh, the inshore Gulf of Maine was not consistently surveyed. Um, we do in the Northeast have the NOAA Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey. However, um, on this map here, as you can see the black polygons are the bottom trawl survey strata, and then the light pastel colors um, are, are the main New Hampshire, our survey strata. As you can see here, we do overlap with some of their survey area, uh, but our shallower strata does not overlap with any of their surveys. So we're able to access this area where that survey is not able to access and provide information on marine resources in that area. And in the areas where we do overlap with them, because we are specifically focus in one area, smaller survey, we have a higher resolution of toes in this area and are able um, to cover more area than they are in their stratus. Um, so without our survey, we wouldn't be having, we wouldn't have any information from the inshore Gulf of Maine like we do with our survey. So our survey is a stratified random design. We stratify by region and depth. So we have about 20 strata. So, um, we have five regions throughout the survey and then four depth strata. And we, uh, the depth strata is listed here on the map. So you can see our different strata and then here's our different regions that we have. And we have these uh, broken out by regions because there's some various oceanographic differences between regions. So that's why we chose this five regions. The survey area covers from the Massachusetts, New Hampshire border up to Canada, um, our border with uh, the main Canada border um, and we survey out to 12 nautical miles and this total area is about 4,500 square miles. Every survey we schedule and plan to have 120 toes and this number of toes will vary by strata depending on the area on each of the strata. Um, we do run into issues with weather and then also sometimes with gear and so we don't always complete the 120 but we do work really hard to try to get that done whenever weather wants to cooperate. <laughs> So for our gear, um, this, our gear was designed with input from um, the groundfish fishery. Um, so they, when we were designing this, we decided to use trawl gear and then use a modified shrimp net because this is able to um, work in the inshore waters in the Gulf of Maine. Our net mesh is two inch polyethylene mesh. We do have a cod end with one inch stretched um, mesh liner. We have steel bison doors um, and our foot rope is actually a cookie frame. Um, Door. And we have for our survey, um, if anyone's like really interested in seeing what our net design is, we have a net manual, a survey um, gear reference manual that we have. It's very useful to us, especially for someone like me coming on. Um, I was new to the survey about four years ago, and this very detailed manual let me understand exactly what, how our gear was designed, um, the different mesh sizes, and um, a lot of other information too. So it's really useful to have um, this and also useful when we have to make new nets. We can send it to our net manufacturer to make sure that they're making the net consistent if we do need a new one. Another important um, aspect of 
our gear is that we have an e-sonar net monitoring system. So this allows us to evaluate our net performance every single tow to make sure that our net is fishing consistently. Because we look at door spread, we have wing spread, we also have a bottom contact sensor to make sure that we're fishing on bottom. And then we have a headline sensor too to um, look at the opening of our net and to make sure it's consistent between toes. And this way, while we're towing, if we notice that the wing spread is coming in and it's um, becoming in too much and clo the net's closing too much for us to say it's consistent to compare to other toes, we can pull it up and then redo the tow if we have to. So I'm gonna show, there should be a video running while I'm gonna just be going over our towing. And this is just from last fall survey. One of our last days um, on the survey, we took a video of pulling in the net. Um, so a standardized tow for us is a 20 minute tow at 2.5 knots. And this covers about 0.82 nautical miles. Um, we chose this towing speed because at the beginning of the survey, they did, they actually went to a flume tank and looked at the catch efficiency at different tow speeds and ended up with 2.5 knots for our speed because um, it was the best speed to catch the species that we were looking for. So once the catch is on deck um, on the table, all of the catch is identified and sorted by species. Uh, once we sort it, um, aggregate weights have been taken for each species and then we go into measuring them. Um, and here, as you can see, we had in this catch um, Atlantic herring and then alewives and some bluebacks too, and some cow. <laughs> So some of the data we collect, um, so we take aggregate species weights of all the species that we catch after we separate them, and then we take lengths on all the species. So for our finfish species, this is, we say total central length, um, and we take it in centimeters, but it's either fork length or total length, depending on the species. And then for any invertebrates like lobsters and crabs, we measure those in millimeters for carapace width. Um, and we have some species like northern shrimp that we take back to the lab and work up in the lab because we need to work on identifying their sex and then also taking their carapace length too. Um, and then for selected species, we take age samples. So we take their otoliths, uh, we take maturity data, and then we'll also take individual weight. So since we are a small survey, we can't take maturity and age data on every single species that we catch. So we only have a select species that we take this data on. Um, and it can vary by the spring and the fall. We have four species that we take from both spring and fall, and then other species that are different between spring and fall. And we try to overlap the best we can with their spawning season to take this data, but because we're limited by the months that we're out there, we do the best we can with that. Um, so for otoliths, we take one otolith per one centimeter length bin, and then we take a maximum sample of 25 from the toe for any of those species. And prior to the start of the survey, we do set um, a total sample size for the whole survey of what we need. And then the otoliths are processed back in the lab, um, which we'll go into next. So this aging lab, this is run by um, Brian Donahue, and her contact information will be at the end of this presentation. So if anyone has questions about any of our otolith work, um, please send them to her because she is um, the otolith ex expert for us. Um, so our aging lab is where we work to digitize age and then create our age length keys for all of our species. Right now, um, we're working through a backlog of about 18,000 otoliths from past surveys. So we're trying to get through those and we've gotten through species um, so far this year that I'll go on and go over in this presentation. Um, and for our otoliths work, we are trained by the aging group at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and we use the same processing methods, um, and we're trained also, they have trained us in the aging methods too, so we can remain consistent, as consistent as possible as we can with them. Um, so here's an example of our setup, um, and where we set the otoliths in wax, and then we section them with an isomet low speed saw. And we go back and work on digitizing them and then aging them. So here's an example of a haddock that we have. Um, that we've aged. We've gotten through all of our haddock. And I know not everyone digitizes their otoliths, but we do it since we are all new. So we want to be able to create a reference collection for us. And when right now Brian's working on setting up a precis precision test for us with haddock to make sure that we're remaining consistent and aging correctly um, between DFO and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center for the species. So also on the survey, we collect environmental data. Uh, we have a seabird CTD. So at the end of each tow, we drop our CTD down and um, take 
samples of the whole water column, but for our data, we specifically just look at the surface and bottom data. So throughout the survey, we've consistently taken water temperature and salinity data at each of our sites. But starting in 2021, we added some more sensors onto our CTD, and we are now taking dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, turbidity, and pH. So we'll now hopefully be able to create a time series of that data to see if there's any changes and be able to relate some other habitat characteristics to some of our distributions of species. Um, so here we have an example of our spring average water temperature that we have seen in the survey over time. Um, the solid line is our bottom temperature, and then the dashed line is our surface temperature. And it's pretty variable over time. And these solid line, the solid blue line here is the bottom temperature average for the time series. And then the dashed line here is the surface temperature average for the time series. So you can see um, in 2021, we had an above average year. And what's notable here is we do have a missing year. So 2020, um, I'll talk about that next. We did not have any data collected, um, but it's going to why we didn't have that. So like most surveys and around the nation, um, we had the COVID-19 impact on the survey. And in spring 2020, we did not have a survey just um, with everything being so new. But um, in fall 2020, we were able to get out and do our survey of which with different um, protocols out there. So we had reduced staffing. We normally say it was four scientists, two crew member and the captain. And we went down with just three scientists and one crew member and the captain. We did shelter at home. We had PCR testing before the survey. And then we also did symptom tracking throughout, throughout the survey too. Um, we kind of, for this, it created a bubble with our team. Um, we kept the same team throughout the survey um, and reduced the amount of interaction outside of that as possible for this. However, in our fall 2020 survey, we were not able to collect maturity or any age data just because of the time constraints of having less people. But um, with this, this year in spring and fall, it mostly got back to normal. Um, we still used testing and we went back to our four scientists, uh, but we still kept the reduced crew because our crew and captain do sleep on the boat. So we felt it was better. If there's just less people sleeping on the boat at least. Um, we got back to taking our age and maturity samples. And in addition, we also took stomach samples. Uh, I'm gonna go over this project in the next few slides um, that Noah has and that we just started, but we weren't able to take some of the sample, stomach samples in our 2020 year just due to age to, or due to timing. <laughs> So to show some um, results from our survey of what we see, I wrote this out by our spring and fall survey of just percent catch biomass um, in the plot on the left. And then also in the table is the top five species that we've caught in the spring survey since 2015 until now. Um, this, that's the average catch number per toe. But what's interesting with our percent catch biomass is we see this change from the beginning of the survey of where we did have um, a lot of our biomass being from herrings. And then once we got into 2011, we do see our um, biomass being dominated by lobsters um, since there was a lobster uh, population increase. So we started seeing more lobsters in our survey after 2011. Um, but when we look at the average catch of number per toe, um, especially just from 2015 on, We've actually had uh, our top five species are Atlantic herring, silver hake, um, two shrimp species, dikilo and um, montague, and then alewife too. You see, tend to catch a lot of those during the spring survey. And then in the fall, it's a little bit different. Um, some of the same species that we catch the same, but you can see on the right is now our percent catch biomass for the fall. And we see where here we catch more gadgets for our for, um, in biomass. We have an increase in gadgets, and that is actually driven a lot by silver hake and also the fact that we tend to catch larger gadgets in the fall than we do in the spring. So we see larger white hake, red hake, larger silver hake, um, larger haddock too in the fall than we do see in the spring. Um, and then we see our lobster biomass isn't as large as it is in the spring, but they are, they then pop up in the top five. Um, species that we catch. And this is mostly because we do tend to catch a little smaller lobsters in the fall, um, just because 
there's more juveniles in the end of the year during this time. Uh, we don't exactly catch them of the year, but <laughs> we're able to catch juvenile, more juveniles during this time. Um, so we catch, tend to catch smaller ones and have less biomass than of them, but we there's just more of them that are too. <laughs> So I want to go over some of our data products from our survey and in all of my examples that I'm going to be uh, showing here, they're all of haddock from our survey in the fall, um, just because we don't have a break in that time series. So I wanted to show those trends and there's some pretty interesting trends that we've seen with them going when we were looking at these. So the, some of the first data products that we have from our survey is providing indexes, indices of abundance. So we can provide the stratified um, average catch with number per toe and the stratified average weight kilogram per toe for every species that we catch, um, catch in our survey. So we can provide both spring and fall indices um, depending on which one is needed. So here uh, we thought it was interesting with Haddock is we see a large increase in 2013 and 2014 and we'll see in the next slides what this is driven by but then this year we also saw a large increase between 2020 and 2021 for Haddock too uh, with a slight increase in um, mean weight. So in the fall, um, just to explain these graphs, the top plot here is the average catch number per toe, and then the bottom plot here is the average weight with the kilogram per toe, and the shaded region is the 95% confidence interval. So we can also provide um, average catch at length data for all of our species and look at these length frequencies to see what we're catching. Um, so, like I said in the previous slide, we saw this big increase in Haddock um, 2013 and 2014, and then again in 2021. And what's interesting is we see that this, the 2013 um, increase is driven by this 10 to 20 centimeter length group. And then in 2014, we see that it's being driven by the 20 to 30 length group. And what we see here is that we're catching a large age zero year class, which I'll show in some other slides too. But it's exciting because in 2021, we saw this large increase between the 10 and 20 um, centimeter bins. And remember catching a lot of 18 centimeter paddock out there this year, which is exciting to see another possibly large year class come through. So with haddock, since we do take their maturity data, we're also able to provide um, the length of 50 percent maturity for them and of the other species that we do take maturity data on. Um, we follow the same protocols as the NOAA bottom trawl survey does. We um, use their same maturity scheme to classify our species. We classify all of our maturity out on the vessel. We don't take any samples back yet to classify under a microscope. Um, but so we just classify by immature, developing, ripe, ripe and running, resting, and then spent. So for all these species, like I said, we're able to um, evaluate this and look at the length of 50% maturity for the inshore Gulf of Maine for when um, these species are caught more inshore waters, especially for some species we're seeing they mature at smaller sizes in the inshore area versus some of um, the offshore areas where they're maturing at larger sizes. So for Haddock here is an example of where, from our data, we're finding that their length at 50% maturity is around 31 centimeters. And for males, it was around 25 centimeters. So next, um, because we take age data for Haddock, we're able to um, look at what ages we're catching throughout our survey and then possibly follow those years plus through our survey. Um, so in 2021, or early this year, we completed aging all of our Haddock adults odalists that we had up until 2019. We haven't gotten back to the ones that we collected in 2021, but because we know most of them were in that 10 to 20 centimeter length range, um, we have an idea of what age they're going to be, which is age zero. Um, so this plot over here shows the fall survey ages for Haddock. So age is on the X axis and then year is on the Y axis. Um, so as you can see here, we found is we do, our survey mostly catches age zero and age one um, haddock. However, in more recent years, we have been seeing older haddock, which is really exciting. As you can see early on in the survey, we didn't really have any haddock that were over the age of three or four, um, where we're starting to see those large um, older ages in our survey now. And with 2013, that large increase that we had, um, that was really dominated by the age zero year class. And now we can see it move 
throughout our survey too. Um, so we're excited to get to age um, to look at the 2021 ages to see if they're all age zero, if there's any age ones there too, and then hopefully see those throughout the survey. So when I was looking at our ages this year, when we um, entered everything and got to pull it out, I was interested in to see where those age zeros were being caught and um, where they were dominated for. So or where that um, group is dom where it's dominated in our survey. Um, what was really interesting when looking at this is we found that a lot of our age zero for fall 2013, um, they were actually caught in our down east regions of the survey. So regions four and five, this is Mount Desert Island right here where Acadia National Park is. So these, this area right here is what we refer to as down east Maine. Um, so as you can see, this is age zero, um, how it catches. And we have a lot that occur in down east Maine. And then with this plot, this is age one, so where the catch distribution is age two, and then age three. We that year we didn't have any older individuals. Um, so I'd be curious, or I'm curious to look into this further, or if anyone is on this talk that knows uh, a lot more detailed information about the haddock population, why they might be um, concentrated in this area, and then um, I'd love to hear that, or I'm excited to look into it too, um, and then. We're able to then look at this data in other years to see if the larger individuals are being caught in southern Maine and maybe this area is a good nursery area for um, the haddock population. But it's just interesting trends that we can investigate with our survey data. So now I'm going to talk about two research projects that we have ongoing with the survey. So when we're out there, we're collecting um, samples for these projects. And the first one. This is a project that NOAA is leading. Um, they come out with us for the survey to collect their samples, and then we work and share results between each other just so we know what the results are. Um, but their project is looking at groundfish consumption of river herring in Mary Meeting Bay and Penobscot Bay, and I'll show you guys where those are on the next slide. Um, the lead for this project is uh, Tim Sheehan. So you can, his email address is here if anyone has any specific questions um, about this project you'll be able to email him. Um, but this project was started in 2012, and the goal of this project is to quantify the contribution of river herring to the diets of in short Gulf of Maine brown fish. The reason why they wanted to do this was there were dam removals in the Kennebec and Penobscot River. Um, they wanted to see if then the increase, or hopefully increase in river herring populations would then increase um, in ground fish diets to help with bring back some of the ground fish that have declined in this area. So, like I said, this they work in for this project in the Mary Meeting Bay, Penobscot Bay. So over here is the full state of Maine, and um, these lines right here denote our regions. So regions one, regions two, region three, region four, region five. So they focus specifically just on our regions two and three. So they only collect samples from these two regions, which so here is the Mary Meaden, region two is the Mary Meaden Bay location, and then region three is the Penobscot Bay location of where they're collecting samples from. So these areas are, are where um, are the offshore parts or offshore areas of where the rivers will, um, the rivers that they remove the dams from uh, go into. So that's why they focus on these areas specifically. So, like I said, they focus on collecting ground fish in those regions in two and three of the survey. The primary species that they look for um, are Atlantic cod, spiny dogfish, and monkfish. Um, they also have secondary species that they collect stomachs from, just silver hake, white hake, and red hake. Some of the preliminary results are promising. They do find that 73% of river herring are consumed in the Marinidin Bay location, so that's our region two of the survey. So far, there's been no evidence of a seasonal trend in river herring consumption between the regions. Um, so on these plots, this the top graphs um, are the spring and fall for the Mary Needham Bay locations, and then the bottom two graphs here are the spring and fall for the Penobscot Bay locations. Um, so what they've seen is that in more recent years, in 20 and 2019, um, that's been where they've seen an uptick in river herring being consumed. So about 55% of river herring has been consumed in 2018 and 2019. As you can see here, um, there's 
this is in the Mary Megan Bay where it's mostly occurring. So, however, they recently just started pursuing genetic ID methods for um, if they're not sure if it's a river herring or not, they're able to send this off and actually confirm if it's a river herring. And with this being used now, there's have been um, very promising results of showing an uptick possibly in river herring being consumed by ground fish in this region. Um, so because this project that only focuses on regions two and three, we've discussed about possibly expanding this and covering our whole survey area since there's lacking information on diet um, data of inshore Gulf of Maine species, um, especially from a long-term survey. There's studies here and there, but there's no data from a long-term survey like us, like ours. So with this in mind, and then some also other questions that we've had, this year we applied for and received funding from um, NOAA's Sea Grants American Lobster Research Program to work on evaluating diets of potential lobster predators. Um, so for this, we're working with the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries uh, to collect some examples from their survey and then also our survey uh, from select species to evaluate the importance of juvenile or young of the year lobster to some of the species that we collect. And the main reason why we're doing this is because we, uh, our lobster research biologists at Maine DMR have been receiving many questions about one, what's eating um, juvenile lobsters? And then specifically, somebody sent in a photo of a stomach they opened uh, from a, an Atlantic mackerel, which is located, this photo is right here, and it had about 20 to 30 young of the year um, lobsters in its stomach. So they were specifically asking if mackerel has been seen um, to increase or they've increased their um, consumption of young deer lobsters. And then also we have a photo of a halibut stomach with lobster in it. So everyone, they were also wondering if halibut is relying on lobster too for their diet. So with that in mind, we designed this study to cover the whole survey area. Also with the Sentinel survey that the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries conducts, they cover more months than we do. So they start in May and have a monthly survey until October. So they're also able to cover the summer months in their survey that we're not able to cover. Um, so we're collecting, they're collecting some examples for us to evaluate this question too. Um, but since we'll be able to cover our whole area uh, of the survey, we'll also be able to provide information back to the Diazer Suspicious Prey study that NOAA is doing and be able to share information to see if we're seeing river herring as prey in other areas. However, we're only focused on five specific species for our study, um, just because we want it for specifically fo focus in on lobster predation. Um, so we picked these species, specifically Atlantic halibut and Atlantic mackerel, because those were species that um, the industry had direct questions about. But then we also are focusing on collecting data from Atlantic cod, red hake, and white hake. Uh, since the Diagenous Business Prey Project that NOAA runs, they have found lobster in the stomachs that they've um, processed. So we use their data to then inform the study to see what species we should really be focusing on for lobster predators. So we have a really good collaboration um, between these two projects and are gonna keep, gonna keep on ongoing. So, so far we just started this project this year. Um, we started collecting stomachs in the fall 2021 survey, and we'll be collecting the stomachs from these species until the spring of 2023. So in this survey, we collected over 100 stomachs, and we are going to be working on process them through the winter. And um, what's really important about this is we are going to be trained by um, NOAA's Northeast Fisher Science Center scientists to processes the stomachs for the Diazmus Business Prey Project, so we can work on remaining as consistent as possible between different um, stomach processors, so we can work on comparing data and sharing data as much as possible. So the most important part of our survey is just where our data is actually used for. So all of our data is used to inform stock assessments and management, and this is both for stocks that are managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the New England Fishery Management Council. So for example, one of the stocks um, our survey data is used for is um, the winter flounder stock in the Gulf of Maine. We're also a very important index for the American lobster um, stock assessment, we're, since um, one of our indices are really important to that assessment too, which is managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. 
Also, our survey, since we have a long term size time series, uh, has been used in a lot of external research projects. Since there are many questions that you can be asked of our survey, um, evaluate from the data that we provide. So, we have many graduate students that have evaluated our data of looking at um, habitat suitability for different species. And then also other researchers throughout the country have used our data to look at the impacts of climate change um, on species distributions or um, on any of ecosystem food webs. Our data has been used in some ecosystem models um, and for many other reasons too. So the data, since we are a consistent long-term survey are really important for every management and also looking at changes um, due to climate change or any other environmental changes. So one thing that we worked on um, within the department was making our data more available to the public and others easier than it was in the past. So in 2020, we finally launched um, our public data portal for the survey. Uh, I believe this will, the link to this will be shared in the chat. Um, so you're able to access this and go on and see all of the indices for all of the species that we catch. You can also look at catch at length data. You can look at the distribution, the catch distribution for any species and any survey that you want. You can look at the maturity data that we see. Um, also look at the environmental data and the trends in our temperature and salinity data. And there's also the option to then download our raw data for if a researcher wants to use it in their um, project, they're able to now go to this website and download it. Uh, we do ask, there is a short form to fill out just to get a login, um, but it's all available easily and publicly. Um, so you can either, if you wanna go and look at it later, we're, you can also just go to our main DMR website and it's on our trial survey webpage too. So with that, I need to thank all of um, our partners and the funding for our survey, um, especially everyone at DMR that has come out in the survey and helped us collect the data. Um, New Hampshire Fish and Game for all of their help for week one. Um, all the captain and crew of the Fish Investor Robert Michael, because we would not be able to do the survey without them. They are a great help um, with everything. And then U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service Support Fish Restoration Program, the Atlanta States Marine Fisheries Commission, and then NOAA Fisheries. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, I have some photos from our survey that we've seen in the past couple of years. Of we actually two years in a row now, we have been catching four beagle sharks um, in our survey, which has been really interesting and unique. Um, and with that, I'll leave our contact information here. Um, I forgot to mention for our stomach project, Lulu Bates will be taking a big lead on it. So if you have any questions um, about that, please feel free to reach out to her and ask her questions. Well, thank you for that great presentation, Rebecca. I really appreciate you accepting our invitation to talk to us and doing it so soon after returning from your fall survey. So thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but I'd like to invite everyone to unmute their microphones and ask questions directly if they have something they want to ask. Um, if not, I was curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about your eSonar uh, data system and um, it's different than what we use in Alaska. And I um, wonder if you could just uh, chat a little bit about uh, how, you, how you visualize that data and then how you use it in the processing later on. Yeah, um, so the eSonar program comes with um, a visualization of where we can look at um, the pinks for the door spread, wing spread, um, bottom contact, and headline height. I wish I had a photo of screenshot of what it looks like, um, but uh, there's a hydrophone listening for it. And when it, it when the net is out in the water, we can see the pings coming through. And we know that our um, what the normal wing spread and door spread should be. So it's about like 90 feet for door spread, and wing spread is 30 feet. So we watch that line to make sure it's staying within that um, range of what's normal. Um, but then after we do keep all of that data, we collect it, um, we record it all while we're out there for every single toe, and then we come back and we'll look at all of our, um, we'll look at all of the values and plot them out. And if we have any that, any toes that 
for some reason we didn't catch while we were out there that don't look consistent, we can drop those toes. But most of the time we um, can catch if a if our net isn't fishing consistently out there, um, we'll catch that and we'll pull the net up and redo the toe if we have to, because we have to watch that um, pretty closely because we do have such a large fixed geared fishery. Um, so we have to watch that because if we do get gear in our net and the wing spread goes in, we pull up as quickly as possible um, just because having gear in your net can also can ruin the net and also just impact your catch too. So. We most of the time when we come back to the lab, we don't, when we look at it, we don't have to drop anything after that. Okay, and then there is a question in the chat from Kurt saying he joined late and he's wondering if you had a slide showing lobster trends by year and season. I did not include any lobster trends on this um, plot or this uh, presentation, but um, there's other presentations that I have that data for, and if you're interested in seeing those, um, I can send them to you. Um, it would also be available on the uh, data on web the page that you had. Yeah. For your toes, I wondered if um, you were using uh, just distance fished or area swept, and if you had area swept, was it uh, doors or the spread? We don't use, so for our um, indices, we only do area swept when, if the stock assessment scientist like asked me specifically for it, because right now we're just doing number per toe, we standardize it by time, uh, by the 20 minutes. Um, but we can get the area swept through our um, e-sonar um, by doing either wing spread or door spread, and it depends on the species. Um, so if they, if one species assessment wants door spread, we could do door spread. Most of them are wing spread, though. And we have to do when we do area swept indices. But so we do have that um, available to do, but we don't pull our data and show it as area swept right away at first. Okay, interesting. And I wondered if you had had an opportunity to compare the trends in um, fish abundance and. Uh, to the offshore survey and if they're the same or are different? We had a few, one species we did that on, um, I did not specifically do it, but the scientists that was in the job before me did, uh, they did look at that for lobster and they did find that they were different. So that's why our um, indices were then included in the lobster stock assessment. Um, so those were found to be different, but we haven't, I haven't done um, my own analysis between Survey is something I'm interested in looking at for different species, especially because um, with having some of our age data now, I'm curious of how it look, compares to other ones. Um, but as others may have done it for um, their research projects, but I haven't done any specifics yet for that. Okay. And then um, I had wondered a question that all the biologists are wondering how long does it take you to process each toe? Uh, it depends. There's some where we, it can take an hour for some, um, up to, depending on what we get, because lobster, we take additional data on, and we do that all through recording. So if we get a large lobster catch, that's what we're processing first, and that can take a while, depending on what we get. Um, we have gotten catches where we, since we are an inshore survey, we catch a lot of small fish, so we'll catch a lot of small fish of Atlantic herring, alewife um, and blueback herring and those sometimes when they're really small as small as they get um, they're very hard to tell apart so those can take an hour to like two hours to working through if they fill up our whole sorting table um. well definitely Has anyone thought of a question they want to ask rebecca and willing to unmute themselves Hey, Rebecca. It's uh, Adam Cook. I'm with uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, we do the lobster stock assessments in our area and have a very similar survey that we're doing in the Bay of Fundy and inshore parts of um, southwestern Nova Scotia. And we're really interested in seeing what you're doing and how similar our two surveys are. We should really chat about, you know, how how we can integrate some of the data or see if how similar 
some of the trends we're seeing are. Um, we actually were using that ESO in our system too, and uh, abandoned it last year because it just it was not working for us at all, and have moved to a different system. So interesting to see how how well it's working for you, and if you've had any any solutions for things that could help us out. So fantastic presentation. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that would be great if we could um, connect and talk about like what we're seeing, like differences or anything. Because I've been wondering when we get up to close to the Bay of Fundy, um, our catch is really interesting. We tend to be more diverse sometimes, uh, so I'd be interested to talk to you about that. Um, and with eSonar, um, we have figured out some tips, some tricks with it. Uh, we have also thought about abandoning it because it can be some issues. We, the most recent survey we had, um, we found, I don't know if this works, but if you didn't put your computer to sleep, um, it actually works the whole survey. We did not really have any issues with it as much as we've had in the past. So that might've helped fix some things. Um, so we could talk about that too, because we've been, we I've gotten multiple emails from eSonar to help of different tricks to try to get it to work when it doesn't want to work. <laughs> Super, look forward to chatting. Thank you. A yeah. couple questions now in the chat. One is from Dan Garatea. He asks, how do you handle excessively full nets like a deck toe? How does that uh, change your sampling? So we, we still processed all of them of where we sort it and um, and work through all of them, but we do have subsampling methods for them. So, especially for when we have a large catch of herring, we for subsampling, like we only measure up to a hundred of um, large catches, and then do expansions um, to get our total number and everything. Um, but when we've had some deck toes, and we're luckily with those, it's mostly because the fish are larger. So it's not that there's generally more fish; it's just larger fish. Um, so we can still we still have enough time to sort through those. We had to, we've developed subsampling protocols for lobsters for if we do get a large catch of those, because we have gotten a very large catch of them before where um, we had to create the subsampling protocols for, uh, but we do have ways to subsample species um, to deal with any of those large ones. A question from Bob Kunsky from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's wondering if you are entering data directly into your database on board, or do you do it after the survey? Because at his agency, they enter the data directly after processing the catch. So we're actually working on upgrading to electronic data entry. We're still figuring out some um, kinks with the links. Um, and because of we started doing this during COVID, and we're hoping to get the app developer on board with us to help us set everything up. Um, so we haven't been able to fully set up our whole um, electronic data entry where we'll be able to enter it um, on board or hopefully on board. Um, so right now we're collecting some data electronically that we can enter into the database right when we get back, um, but we do still enter our catch and link data um, after the survey. So, but we are, our goal is for that not to happen in the next few surveys and to fully transition to electronic data entry. Are your your observation and data entry solutions, it sounds like you're developing a lot of that in-house or off the shelf um, stuff? We have went with, um, we a serve, another survey on the East Coast uses a, program called Feed. So we're, it's not developed in house. We're um, going with a different, with an app um, and measuring board that same similar measuring board that they use. Uh, so we have some issues with our, since we do um, charter a commercial fishing vessel, it's harder for us. We don't have as much space as other surveys do with um, for their electronic setup. So we just have to rethink of how we're setting everything up. Uh, and we've gotten help from other surveys on the East Coast that have similar situations as us. Um, to get help into how we can think through setting up our data or setting up our processing and measuring boards just because we have to break everything down at the end of every single toe. Uh, we'll have to move everything off the deck so we can then do our next toe. So it's just 
thinking through those logistics is the hardest part. Um, not actually having the boards and app system. It's more of just how to set it up is the hard part. It looks like Kurt has unmuted himself. Did you have a question, Kurt? Okay, there's one in the chat from Jen Blaine asking if you use digital scales and digital fish measuring boards. If so, what brands of each do you use? We use uh, Merrill scales um, and then for the fish measuring boards, um, they're big thin scientific boards that we're going to be upgrading to. Correctly. Getting thank yous coming in and yeah, again, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing your, your trial survey with us. We're very interested in how you're solving these problems because we're all facing a lot of the same difficulties um, doing this work. Um, perhaps there's room for us to keep chatting after this is over and and um, share resources and um, try to move trial surveys forward. So thank you again. And, yeah, thank uh, you. And thank you to everyone for joining this seminar and the seminars that we've had this year. It's been a great year for us and uh, hopefully we'll be back again next year. So thank you.